sold it to me for seven hundred dollars, which was a uh, which was a lot, uh, but I had saved up. And then uh, she she wanted to charge me extra for the aftermarket Kensington. Was it Kensington? No. Kensington stereo system. There was a stereo system in there. Maybe it was Kensington. It I can't remember. Like an Alpine or a oh Alpine. I think you're right. Alpine. I think it was Alpine. She had right. Alpine speakers in there, and she wanted to charge me extra. And I was like, No, take them back. <laughs> I can put the. I don't want them. She's like, Fine, I'll leave them in there. Uh, so when I traded it in, you know, I made a big deal about the Alpine speakers and, you know, very politely, the dealer's like, yeah, I don't know that that really is going to add that much to your trade. It Listen, down. this rust isn't rust. It's just the, it's the uh, Auburn primer coming. I the think paint. I got $500 in trade in credit uh, for the $700 Maverick that I'd bought. And I'd only had it for a few months at that point, or less than every, a year. Anyway. Every car I've had, I've driven into the ground. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> It's like, what happened to the wheels? Uh, yeah, and I, so, right? I drove the Mustang until uh, it was on its last legs. I drove it for around, I don't know, I think it was 96 when I finally got rid of it. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah, I sold it to a guy in Austin, and I bought a Saturn. Oh. And I had a Saturn yeah. in Austin for a couple years. Then I got really poor and sold the Saturn and didn't have a car until I married Eileen. Nice. <laughs> so things really took off with the Saturn, but he came back to Earth when he sold it. Yeah. The Saturn is just a gateway drug to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, what's the other one? What's the one you have now? Uh, Prius? Yeah, the Prius. I always yeah. felt like Saturns were like. Well, I had, I had a Saturn, stick shift Saturn in Austin. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I sold it like in 98. Didn't have a car until 2002. So I guess Eileen and I weren't married yet, but we bought a car. Cause she only had, she had a Toyota Corona, an 80, uh, 81 Corona. And we wanted to, we bought a brand new Saturn again. So I went from owning a Saturn to not owning a car to owning a Saturn. Then the Corona's axle broke in the tech TV parking lot. Uh, so we got, that's when we got, I guess we just dealt with you, a single car for a while with the Saturn. And then I was working at CNET by the time we bought the Prius. Did she ever say the words? need to sell my Corona. Did that ever happen? I did. Uh, no, I said that oh, a lot. And she just shook her head and was like, yes. <laughs> no, please. no. Uh, that's too bad. So then that Prius that I bought when I worked at CNET in 2004 is the Prius I drive today. We had another Prius that I drove for a while to Petaluma when I was working at Twit, but we traded that one in 2015 for the Audi that Eileen drives now. Gotcha. There's my entire car history. There you go. Pretty good. All right. You guys ready to do a show? Hell yes. yeah, man. Uh, am I? Yeah, let me get in the right tab again. <laughs> All right. I will count you in, Mr. Mr. Johnson. All right. Uh, here we go. Tell me when you're ready. Well, I'm almost ready. Okay, here we go. All right, go now. Three, two. Jocelyn Moffat has supported independent tech news directly for five years. Be like Jocelyn. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 20th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Jake. Uh, Sarah Lane, uh, unavoidably detained at the vet uh, today for her cat. Uh, but uh, hopefully things will go well and she will be back tomorrow. We are going to talk quite a bit about some GDC news of various types, including a little deeper dive into the Epic Games announcement from earlier today. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Norwegian manufacturer Hydro was largely operating on a manual basis Wednesday after a cyber attack that started Monday. The attack began in U.S. offices of Hydra and then spread to the plants in Norway on Tuesday. Ransomware known as Locker Goga locked up systems. Hydro said it had no plans to pay a ransom and believed it could back everything up from or, or bring everything back online from backups. Uh, Hydro turns aluminum ingots into components for car makers, builders, and other industries. Just to stave off any controversial emails, Hydro, not Hydra. We know it's not the uh, hail super secretive Hydro. Yeah, yeah. Hail Hydro. Uh, Disney now owns most of 21st Century Fox. Oh, yes, that's right. This is finally happening. Closing the deal at 12.02 a.m. Eastern. This is on Wednesday or today. 
A new company called Fox Corporation spun out Tuesday with Fox News, Fox Broadcast channels, and the national uh, channels of Fox Sports. That all stayed uh, not part of this. That was always the deal. The regional Fox Sports Network must be sold by Disney in 90 days, uh, but it's done. Finally. Yeah. Fantastic Four. Now part of Disney. <laughs> yeah. Apple continued its hardware announcements this week with an updated set of Apple AirPods. Uh, the new AirPods look like the previous generation. There's no design changes, but they include the new H1 chip, which can support Siri activation by voice. Currently, AirPods require a tap to activate Siri. Apple also claims 50% more talk time and faster switching between Bluetooth devices. There's also a new charging case available for either the old or the new model of AirPods that works with any Qi wireless charger. So you just drop the AirPods on the charger and they start working. The new AirPods cost 159 bucks. If you want the wireless charging case, it's 199 bucks. And if you've got the old AirPods and you just want the wireless charging case, that'll run you 80 bucks. I think I'm getting that case. Uh, Kasper I never say this right. Kaspersky Lab has filed an antitrust complaint with the Russian Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. Uh, Kaspersky notes that after Apple launched its own screen time function, it notified Kaspersky, Kaspersky <laughs> that its Safe Kids app violated App Store policies by using configuration profiles to monitor kids' usage of iOS devices. Kaspersky noted that Apple's cracked down on other screen time applications at the same time. Uber Freight is an Uber-owned unit that helps connect truck drivers with shipping companies, and it's launching its app in the Netherlands Wednesday. More European countries are planned later this year. Uh, previously, Uber Freight only operated here in the United States. Uber Freight right now in the U.S. has about 30,000 active users. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Microsoft's reaction to Google Stadia. Therat.com's Brad Sams who uh, I am constantly in awe of his ability to get these stories. Uh, he, he is the uh, Mark German of Microsoft stuff. Published a memo from Microsoft's head of gaming, Phil Spencer. Phil Spencer told his employees regarding Google Stadia, Google went big today, and we have a couple of months until E3 when we will go big. Uh, and obviously he's referring to xCloud. Uh, Microsoft just demonstrated the xCloud game streaming service uh, the last week, week before, mm -hmm. and is expected to announce more about that at E3. And that's that's pretty much what this memo means. So Scott, this gives us a chance to get your reaction to Google Stadia, first of all, that came out yesterday. And also where the, the Microsoft reaction fits into this whole thing as, as streaming game services of one flavor or another seem to be the new wave. Well, the Stadia announcement is real skin in the game. As you guys discussed yesterday, it is quite literally the announcement of a brand new platform. There's no service yet. They didn't really get that detailed, but they announced a platform yesterday that is pretty significant if they can deliver on everything they talked about on that stage. It was impressive, kind of across the board. And having had some experience with their test in Chrome when they were running Assassin's Creed Odyssey on there, I can say that even that tiny taste left me wanting more. I was extremely blown away and impressed by that. And I've used a lot of these services that claim relatively seamless sort of lag-free experiences. And that was definitely the best I'd seen running on my browser on a MacBook of all places. So uh, it was them laying down the gauntlet and saying, yep, we're in this thing. And it is, given their access to um, what infrastructure they have and given the breadth of, of uh, what Google is capable of, this is a major announcement and cannot be ignored by the other big players. Microsoft has already been hard at work on this direction. We already kind of knew that. Um, the only thing we really didn't know is what was Google's play going to be? And now we know, or at least a, a, you know, a big thrust of it, we know what it is. And it's now on Microsoft, who has arguably the best chance to compete against that level of architecture, that level of size uh, and readiness they the big spotlight on them come June when we get E3 because they're going to have to get up there and say, <clears throat> all right, that's great and all, but here's what we're doing and really blow our minds. They've been working uh, pretty tirelessly on kind of a rebuilding of Microsoft games, what that looks like over there, what Xbox looks like. And hopefully all of that translates into something this summer anyway that we can look at and go, ah, okay, now we know what their answer will be. Or better yet, we as consumers might have a better idea of, what the competition is and why we would want one over the other. Um, it's going to be really, really exciting and, and interesting. And I actually now think <laughs> whether we know it or not, the next two platform leaders of the next 
generation, if you want to call it that, possibly the last generation, uh, will probably be Microsoft and, and Google. I don't think Sony has what they need to do this. They have a service now, and they can claim that now. They can say, oh, we got the streaming service now, everybody. But it's just their own games. It's not as wide-reaching. Uh, they don't have the, the the reach, certainly, that Google has, and, and Microsoft's prepared to offer something maybe similar. So really intense feelings for a lot of us about what happened yesterday. It was a big deal. Yeah, and I feel like Microsoft has an advantage here because Google has infrastructure, right? They're good with delivering data around the world. Uh, and they they have to be pretty latency sensitive in delivering that data and with services like YouTube and even some of their enterprise services. Uh, Sony, great at games, making games, getting you to love games. They're the leader in getting you to want to buy their console because you want to play their games. Microsoft, pretty good at that. Not as good this last time around as Sony, arguably, but pretty good at that. Microsoft also operates Microsoft Azure, which is really good infrastructure. So they're competitive in both of the things you need to make a successful gaming service. So I'm very curious what they're going to announce at E3. Yeah, me too. And I also, if what Google plans to do at E3, either in response or in tandem or whatever they're going to do, Sony's response is going to be my most interested thing here because they don't have a response right now. They kind of are left in like, oh, crap, we are king of the of the way things are done right now. But the mm -hmm. way things are going to be done, this put, makes them at least seem very behind. So maybe they team with Amazon and get the infrastructure they need. Amazon yeah. doesn't show any signs of <laughs> doing this themselves and never say never. There's some rumors out there that Amazon is looking into this too, but yeah, maybe it is in partnership with somebody like Sony. And, and then there's Nintendo, which is just a whole other, they, they never do what everybody else is doing anyway. So it's hard to tell how this impacts them. Uh, we're actually going to have Trisha Hershberger on the show on Friday to kind of do a GDC recap uh, after all of this settles out. So I'm sure we'll be talking more about this then. Guaranteed. Well, Oculus VR announced something new. So get excited, VR enthusiasts. The new Oculus Rift S, built in partnership with Le Lenovo, has a 1280 by 1440 resolution per eye. Not bad. Not the high end, but not bad. Uh, the 80 hertz refresh rate down from 90 to maintain PC compatibility. And, and they raised the resolution, but they lowered the refresh rate so that they didn't have to make everybody buy a new PC. Yeah. The ding here, well, I don't know. Refresh rate is everything with VR, at least in my mind, because that's where yeah. I think the headaches, the higher it is, the better it is. But I guess we'll see. Anyway, this also includes path, pass through plus rather, which shows you your surroundings and a built in tracking system called Oculus Insight forthcoming standalone oculus headset will have the same tracking system but will have a more comfortable psvr style strap which uh, uh, important to, to say you, you you dropped a word there the oculus quest which oh, the is quest the sorry one. yeah, yeah. They, it, it went in my head but didn't come out of my mouth the quest is actually the one vr uh update or the one piece of vr equipment that i'm most excited about right now actually what they've shown of that seems really great but both have a more comfortable strap uh, so use is going to be easier that way. Both the uh, Rift S and the Oculus Quest will cost $399 and ship this spring. Facebook F8 developer conference is scheduled for April 30th. You can count on some of that being shown there. Yeah, I think it's interesting that they're pricing them the same, basically saying, uh, do you want a little bit more power but be tethered, or are you a little more like console casual gamer sit on your couch? Yeah, mm -hmm. and you don't want to be tethered, Get you get the Quest. Yeah, uh, It's $399 either way. The European Union fined Google 1.49 billion euros Wednesday, it's about $1.7 billion, for blocking rival online search advertisers. Google was accused of restricting publishers from placing advertisements from competing ad services on the publisher's search results page. So they were saying, you can run AdSense, and you can run AdSense in your, in your publication's search engine, but if you do, we're not going to let you run ads from competing advertisers. The EU said, not okay. Google says it's going to boost price comparison rivals. It will drop those restrictions. And in response to another antitrust case, the one they paid 5 billion euros uh, uh, as a fine, the one about tying Chrome to Android, Google says it will now prompt European Android users to choose a browser and default search engine rather than just defaulting to Chrome and Google. Uh, Google had already stopped requiring Chrome and search apps to be installed along with the Google Play Store, though it now charges manufacturers a licensing fee for the store with or without Search and Chrome. Uh, if you're keeping track, Google has now been fined three times in the EU. There were three major antitrust 
uh, cases. They've been fined in all three cases, the biggest one being Android. Uh, the second largest were fines for AdSense and Android. Uh, I'm sorry, the second largest were fines for using its own search engine to direct people to Google Shopping mm. uh, versus allowing other shopping platforms to be up there at the top. Uh, and the the third, the, the smallest of the fine is this one that we heard about today, 1.49 billion euros. Mm. Do you think, uh, <laughs> this is a very cynical view, but uh, it feels like the EU might be funding its entire um, fiscal platform on just making sure that Google has regular fees being paid. <laughs> I know, really I mean, that's the case at it's all. It's easy to say that because a billion euros is a lot to you. Yeah. It's honestly not that much for Google and it's it's more for the European Union than it is for Google uh but uh, I'm sure uh, it's it's a drop in the bucket of the the total European Union's budget uh and expenditures. It's certainly I don't want to say it's not a revenue maker for the European Union, but that's not why they're doing it. Uh, the, the reason they're doing it is, is Marguerite Vestager and 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 the others uh, think that that Google is being unfair to European companies, and and they they want to level the playing field. It's yeah. it's about making things more fair for endemic companies in Europe. I think. Yeah, there is a scenario though in my head, of maybe a comic you'll have to draw it or something, but. Microsoft Windows is just winking off in the corner going, see what it's like to be the dominant operating system on every, on the handheld across the world? Well, isn't that interesting too, right? There's no, uh, Microsoft's requirement to offer a browser choice window in Windows ended in 2014 yeah. and it hasn't come back. No, nobody's putting edge on their computers. Any, well, they're not, they're and ignoring Even it. without the browser choice uh, thing in Europe, you still don't have Microsoft dominating. So, I mean, you make the argument that, oh, that it worked. Uh, it, it leveled the play playing field and now we don't need that measure anymore. And I suppose maybe you can make the same argument with Android, we'll see. Yep. Uh, the US Supreme Court threw out a decision by a lower court upholding a settlement where Google paid a class action group 8.5 million over a privacy dispute. The uh, class argued Google violated federal privacy law by allowing websites to see users search queries the Supreme Court directed the lower court to evaluate whether the class had been harmed by Google and therefore determine it had legal standing to sue. This is uh, this is a little bit of a wonky story, uh, but it, but it's important uh, because it is the U.S. Supreme Court saying, uh, no, look at this closer. You can't just sue somebody because they're doing something that violates your privacy. You have to show that violating your privacy harmed you. In some way, there is, and, and and essentially, what the Supreme Court is saying is there is no absolute right to privacy. It's okay to violate your privacy if nobody gets hurt, uh, and they're saying that the lower court didn't adequately demonstrate that Google allowing other websites to see the search queries in any way caused damage to the class. Uh, it doesn't mean that the class won't prevail, uh, but it does mean they now have to prove that harm, which is which is a higher burden to prove uh, than than just being able to show that the privacy was violated at all. Right. I mean, I'm completely out of my lane when I talk about any of this sort of stuff, but I will say, not because Sarah Lane's not here, not that kind of lane. Lane on a highway is what I mean. Mm. Anyway, I feel like this is like exactly the opposite thing that might happen in the EU cases. Like them saying it's not uh, built in harmful to have your privacy violated. It feels like the EU is way harder on that point to say, well, it doesn't matter. Your bias, your, your privacy is violated by its very nature. That's a, that's a form of harm. Um, that's just an interesting difference to me. Well, it's a legislative versus a judicial one, right? right. What, what the EU did was said, we are going to make a law called the GDPR that says violating privacy is bad and you can't do it. And if you do it, we'll fine you. Well, what the court here is saying is there is no such law in the United States. Uh, and under the laws that we have, you have to show harm. You can't just show a privacy violation until such time as Congress decides to pass a law that says violating privacy in any respect uh, or in these respects in particular is, is against the law. Hmm. Sorry for the civics lesson. No, I lie. No, to be sorry. I love this stuff. This is one of my favorite discussions. Uh, let's uh, finish up our top stories with uh, getting back into some GDC stuff. Lucasfilm. Luke, Lucasfilm Games. <laughs> recently. Yeah, you heard me right. Lucasfilm Games recently posted job listings for producers and marketers in 
a division called Lucasfilm Games. Again, now the positions would oversee development of games based on Lucasfilm IP for consoles, PC, smartphones, and AR and VR platforms. This is not LucasArts. LucasArts still exists under Disney as a licensor of its games. Mm -hmm. It does not develop them anymore. It does appear that Disney, maybe not hiring developers for this, but hiring some people to manage third-party developers for creating games under the Lucasfilm banner. Uh, it's important to note here that EA still has the exclusive rights to Star Wars games until 2023. And honestly, Lucasfilm doesn't have a whole lot of other IP that isn't Star Wars. Uh, though EA has only released two games since it got the rights in 2013. So this may be a little long-term positioning of Disney to say, you know, we don't want to get stuck with this again. Let's let's build some in-house management of this and not maybe not give somebody an exclusive, but even if we do, have a little more pressure from our side to make people do good games and do them regularly. Yeah, there's a load of, um, in brief, there's a lot of games LucasArts is responsible for from the 90s and beyond that they could get reattached to, do some new things with, whether that's themselves or licensing it out. Right now, it sounds like a licensing thing or at least a, a way to manage those IPs so that they're not being squandered. Um, and with EA really blowing it lately with their with their uh, license to make Star Wars games, they've had at least two cancel, canceled large, big profile games that have been canceled. There's a couple we still don't know about, but they also didn't do so great with Battlefront 2. Um, it kind of fizzled and I had a lot of controversy around it when it came to free to play stuff. So at the end of all of this, this does just feel like Disney saying, well, let's just, you know, let's just pad, pad it up a little bit here. Let's sandbag it up for the, for the other stuff. And for a few ideas we have, who knows, Indiana Jones could come back in a big way in video games. That's a Lucas games thing. Like there's possibilities here and they feel like they're, I feel like they're hedging their bets and it's not really costing them that much to do that. So probably a good yeah. And, and, and there's some good questions kicking around in the chat room. Uh, this is not necessarily like Google having Google Play Music and YouTube Music because there is no <laughs> there is no equivalent position for LucasArts anymore. Right. Uh, that's just managing licenses. So this is actually going farther than what LucasArts does. And also Lucasfilm Games isn't an oxymoron. It's taking the Lucasfilm properties and turning them into games. Yes, that is something LucasArts did in the past, but LucasArts isn't going to do that. This is Disney saying, we don't want to get into game development again. We don't want to own a video game company right now, but we do want to have more of a hand in the games that are created based on the Lucasfilm properties. You're right. Okay. And arguably it's due in part because this EA thing hasn't worked out in their favor and perhaps they're just holding stuff a little closer to the chest. Yeah. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day and spend less than five minutes doing it, keep up to date. Subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right. Last thing we're going to talk about today is Epic uh, not only having a press conference today, but CEO Tim Sweeney making the rounds, giving interviews to a bunch of outlets and talking about the Epic Game Store and, and some of the problems that Valve is having with Steam, et cetera. Let's talk about the press conference first. Uh, Epic showed off ray tracing upgrades in Unreal 4.22, now in preview with full version due in two weeks. If you've got one of those fancy new NVIDIA cards, uh, that is of interest to you. Uh, they also showed Unreal 4.23, scheduled to go live in June, which has the chaos system uh, using physics to generate realism. So they showed a lot of like massive destructible environments, some cool rigid body dynamics. Uh, they had a demo called Rebirth that you can find and look at if you want to see Unreal's photorealism capabilities. And then Troll was a demo uh, that showed off the new ray tracing power. Epic launched a platform and engine agnostic SDK called Epic Online Services to support large-scale matchmaking, voice communications, cloud storage, sentiment analysis, game analytics, and a ticketing system. And numbers-wise, Fortnite has nearly 250 million registered players, up from 200 million in December, with 10.8 million concurrence. Uh, Sweeney told Ars Technica half of Fortnite players on PC have never used Steam before. Uh, so if you had any doubts that Epic was dominating with Fortnite, well, you, now you don't. Uh, but, but Scott, what did you make of all of these uh, demos and such? Well, the demo for the new features in the engine itself, this is the thing you always forget about Epic. Lately, the Epic news has always been, hey, Epic, they're the guys who run Fortnite and are making a trillion dollars a minute and they're dominating the industry now and what are video game makers going to do? And then you have the Epic Game Store, which is this, hey, why are they going to come in here and disrupt the market and make Steam rethink its position or at the very at the very least displace this market around a little bit, which somebody's sort of been waiting for someone else to do for a while. Steam's had quite the dominance there. 
And then there's this company who is interested in running, uh, you know, running uh, this engine and this store sort of concurrently, giving better deals to people who sign up for or that sign on to have their games on their store and a better cut of the of the money. Like they're they're pushing lots of boundaries here. They also benefit in this new uh, Stadia world we potentially could live in and cloud gaming and xCloud mm -hmm. and so on because you're still building games. A lot of games are being built on it on Unreal and Unreal Engine. And what Google talked about the other day, what I expect Microsoft will talk about in a couple of months, only serves to bolster Epic and their position even more as the creator of the most versatile and realistic engine in the in the world. Because then that engine, with as many teraflops as they're promising us, will look amazing no matter what your connection and no matter how crappy your laptop is. So there's a lot of like synergy already happening there. And then they've got this dominance with Fortnite. They've got this, this uh, insurgence with the Epic Game Store. Uh, it's, it's fun to look at this because as a longtime Unreal fan, playing Unreal back in the 90s, playing Unreal Tournament till my eyes bled in the late 90s, early 2000s, I have always loved Epic as a company. To see them in a, this weird new position, primarily on the shoulders of, well, uh, two factors, their incredible business engine, or the engine business rather, and then Fortnite is crazy. And it just means that they are right up in front. Like there's, we can have these conversations about what the next generation looks like, what Microsoft or Google are gonna do. It's just odd seeing Epic right up there in the middle of all that and you can't avoid them and they're there to stay and they're going to have a finger in all of this stuff so i realize i'm kind of all over the map here but i'm excited because that disruption and displacement they're doing with their store is good they did talk about for example they're going to have standards yeah so, yeah let, let, yeah, let me talk let, let's talk that. a little bit about the some of the things that sweeney said in interviews uh he said a lot about the epic game stores uh, if you don't realize, Epic Game Store for PC lets developers keep 88% of the revenue. Uh, there are about 85 million total players with Epic Game Store installed. He threw out some stats like Deep Silver's Metro Exodus uh, is selling two and a half times better in its first week as an Epic Game Store exclusive uh, versus its predecessor Metro Last Light did on Steam. Uh, it's doing one and a half times better on console. So, you know, it's even better on Epic than it was on console. And uh, they've got some new exclusives. That's not going to stop. Despite devs keeping more of the sale price, though, uh, prices have not gone cheaper on Epic versus other outlets. And Sweeney told Ars Technica he thinks that the price of games on the store will drop as developers get used to the new revenue share and realize they can sell more copies at a lower price and not lose money. And they can take some of that extra money that they're getting at 88% instead of 70% and reinvest it in the games. Then there's the matter of what gets allowed in. And Scott just mentioned this. Steam has been courting controversy by saying they would allow anything legal in the store unless it was straight up trolling. Uh, Sweeney sees things differently. He told The Verge, Epic respects developers' complete creative freedom to develop anything with its tools on the engine. He's like, you're using our engine. You can do whatever you want as long as you're not breaking the law. But on the store, Epic prioritizes high quality experiences. He told The Verge, we're not going to accept pornographic or shock content of any kind. We're not in the porn business here. PC is an open platform. Those devs can reach gamers in other ways if they want. So Epic's going to open up the store to submissions from all partners later this year, but it's still going to apply a high quality standard to which games it allows in the store. 100%. Tim Sweeney, team Tim Sweeney on this. I wish this was the voice that Steam would find. If Valve would find this particular voice, that would be great. And this isn't me going, oh yes, we need to, I'm not trying to be a prudish standard bearer or anything. Uh, I just think his knowledge of it's an open platform. They can find their other ways. There's no such thing as censorship here. This isn't a government issue. This isn't any of those things. If you're going to make a game called Rape Day, we're not going to let it be on our platform because we have standards and then we as gamers can go there are the standards i now make my buying decisions based on if i like those standards or not and that is all i wanted to hear from these guys and i and it really bumped my excitement about what epic is doing a few notches because up till now it's been a little boring over there to be honest there's some mm -hmm. games there's some exclusives but you know it's slow going out of the gate they're not going to be nearly the steam library that i have now right off right off but it's enough for me to hear this to go, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm in supporting this idea and moving forward with it. And valve was just so 
crappy about their response a couple of weeks ago, in my opinion, that uh, this just seemed like a breath of fresh air. And then put on top of that, one of the coolest engine demos I've seen in years. And it, it's just got me all excited about Epic right now. Yeah, I, Steam, Steam sometimes has a little mission creep where they think of themselves as the platform, not yeah. just the store on the platform. And, and that shows with Steam Box and, and wanting to, to make games that, that work cross-platform on Linux, et cetera, which isn't a bad thing. Um, but Epic's saying, we're, we're not. We're, we're, we're not the platform. We are just a store, and we will decide what we stock in our store. Yeah, one, one think, final thing I want to throw out there, as you said earlier, that a lot of people haven't even used Steam and they're using uh, the store now and they use Fortnite, never even touched Steam before. That cannot be discounted. There is a legion of young game fans. This was their gateway and this is now where they're at and this is kind of where they'll stay. And I think that is a massive shift. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. A couple of emails before we go. Norm said, uh, hey, Tom, kudos on the interview you did with Jack Conti. If anyone thought you'd softball him, they were wrong. I'm glad that came across. And you got your answer while still handling it very professionally. Now let's hope they don't announce tomorrow they're getting bought by PayPal. I hope, to, I so, hope so too, Norm. But if you didn't realize there is an interview uh, that I did with Jack Conti about the Patreon creator platform changes. Uh, you can find that in your feed or at dailytechnewsshow.com. I also got an email from Sam who said he had some feedback about Google Stadia uh, from the perspective of someone living in Belgium. Uh, Sam says, Patrick was saying that most of Europe had internet without data caps, but at least for Belgium, it's more complicated than that. You can get a kind of unlimited internet here, but it's pretty expensive for Europe and it works with a fair use policy. This policy basically still is a cap that limits you to lower bandwidth once you go over it. As to the bandwidth requirements, I think most people in Belgium can reach those for this Google Stadia, although for some, just barely. For the VDSL provider, 30 megabits per second is attainable for a large portion of the users. And for the cable provider, probably everybody should be able to get 30 megabits per second. I hope this provided you with another European perspective. I love the show, and me and my girlfriend listen to it every morning when we're driving to work together. Well, I hope you're having a lovely drive, Sam and Sam's girlfriend. And thank you for writing in. This was great and valuable perspective. Yeah, I uh, there's a lot of talk. This is maybe the main talk I've heard about uh, Stadia, which is... Uh, fodder for another episode since we don't have a lot of time but i just want to say this i think that gaming has always been a great pusher of boundaries it's been able to go out there and say all right push tech in this way just because we want to play better games and then that ends up being something rad we can use in other parts of society i think my prediction these cloud-based gaming services if they're all they've promised them to be will have the effect of making it so isps will be less dependent on data caps and that data caps will be a thing of the past one day. And I think this will be part of what makes that happen. You can find perspectives like that along with Patrick Beja at dailytechnewsshow.com slash MVGB. That's the monthly video game briefing. Uh, Scott and Patrick host that show once a month. I'm sure they'll be talking about this in the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. And of course, you've got your own outlets for talking about gaming all the time, Scott. Yeah, tonight there's a brand new episode of The Core Show, uh, which recently had a bit of a format change. We now talk about video gaming for the hardcore and core gamers. And this definitely has uh, a lot to do with what we think. So if you want to hear our perspectives, check it out at frogpants.com slash core. Uh, again, that's tonight. That'll be live. You can also catch, catch it on the podcast. And if you really, really want to know what I think about cloud gaming, that's going to be the place to find it this week. If you haven't already become a member, join us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And we're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> nice we did it scott we did we prevailed we did we we the challenge came and we took it head Sadly, on hail hydro is the top suggestion for the time <laughs> <laughs> uh actually like epics epic updates from kelly 138 that's not bad it's not bad uh yeah. there's also king of the way things are done zoe <laughs> like that one mm. Uh, Lucasfilm games Ooh. question mark mm. uh, game streaming roundup 
Yeah, I think Epic's Epic updates. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. It's pretty go good. That. Pretty good. Yeah, they're uh these guys are killing it. Can I tell you one of my greatest regrets in life, What's Scott? That? What's that? For about a month, oh. the sign on the pie shop read French vanilla cherry pie. Oh no. Special. I never Where this is going. There. Yeah. I never got there. Yeah. By the time I got back to the pie shop, it was gone. I asked, is there any more French vanilla cherry pie? And the waiter waitress who's who's great. I get the same waitress all the time. She actually knows my order. She's like, oh, she's like, no, it's I actually ate the last one. <laughs> but the hell she she's like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make that a taunt. And I'm like, no, I'm I'm glad it went to a good home. Mm. That's awesome. But I never got never got the French vanilla. Cherry pie. Oh, that's so um, Roger, are you trying to say something I could I couldn't hear? Oh no, I was saying um that she ate it. I can't figure she, she did. It. She ate it. Yeah. I would eat it. I don't blame her. I would have I would have eaten it too if there was what? only one slice left. Her perks are working there, you know. I, I should have got my uh myself in gear and got over there faster. That's all. It wasn't like it wasn't on the sign for a month. I right. was there the whole time. You snooze, you lose. That's right. That's someday, true. someday. I will, it will return again and I will try it because I love cherry pie. Cherry pie is my favorite. They have a great cherry pie there. And I had that day, the cherry pie, not the French vanilla cherry pie, but I was curious what their French vanilla addition would be like. What, what makes it French, French vanilla? That's a good question. Um, yeah. What is French vanilla? I mean, you always see that as an ice cream flavor too. Yeah, uh, nice. What's the difference between vanilla and French vanilla? Does it um, um, castigate you as you eat it? Like, comes down to eggs. Ah, uh, French vanilla tends to have a slightly yellow coloring, while plain vanilla is more white because the base of French vanilla ice cream has the yolks in it. Mm. The eggs give French vanilla ice cream a smoother consistency and a subtle yellow color. The taste is a little richer and a little more complex than regular vanilla. So it's not the vanilla, it's the eggs. Yeah. So if it's French vanilla cherry pie, does that mean... It's got ice cream in it, or did they just serve cherry pie with a scoop of French? <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't run out if they were just serving cherry pie with a scoop of French vanilla ice cream on it, I guess. Right. I wouldn't think so. It must have been like the syrup had French vanilla flavoring in it. Funny. I remember, I don't know why I have this in my head, but you have multiple times expressed your love of cherry pie. As soon as you started talking about it, I went, oh, that's Tom's favorite thing, even though mm -hmm. I wasn't sure where I'd heard it before. Clearly, I've heard it. <laughs> No, uh, I am a, a huge fan of, of cherry pie. Cherry pie is pie to me. When someone says pie, the thing that appears in my mind is a slice of cherry pie, which I know for a lot of people in the United States, it's apple pie. Yeah. I don't really true. like apple pie that much. It's okay. I like, I like a peach cobbler. Oh, peach cobbler is real good. Nothing wrong with peach pie. pie. I, I, I really cobbler, love cobbler's even better. I'll agree, but even peach pie, I, I like a peach. There's I something like about pies. there's something about peaches being used in food recipes that, for some reason, makes it like ten times more compelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like I love peaches. Yeah, and I I understand that pie often in parts of the world means savory pies, right? You know, like a like a a mincemeat or a shepherd's pie or something like that, and I like those too. Right. But man, the fruit pie, that's that's where it's at. Cherry, any kind of berry, blueberry, blackberry, boysenberry. Oh, dude. Berry. Same. I mm. yeah. I wish they made those hostess pies, but without as much cholesterol and sugar and wax or garbage in it. Yeah. Perfect. I was just gonna say there are times where I actually really get excited about a crappy hostess pie at a gas station or something. But then oh. you flip it over and you look at the low nutrition label, it's like, oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. When I started noticing that the that the grease was coming through the plastic, like right. the wrapper, it's like ah, that's way too much. Yeah, <laughs> it's all true. Nothing healthy is happening there. Doesn't I? And that's why, honestly, I didn't get to the French vanilla pie because I was trying to eat healthier, and I was like, no, I shouldn't get pie today. I'll get it later, and then I just put it off too long. You are. Better man than I. Beatmaster is right. I am a fan of the the TV show Pushing Daisies. Great show. Yeah, 
It's a showrunner of the guy. Is it Brian Fuller who did, who's doing? Uh, I believe he did. Yeah, pushing daisies. Brian Fuller of Star Trek Voyager, American Gods, Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, that guy's great. He keeps getting fired from all my favorite shows. Oh, pushing daisies got canceled because of a writer strike. Uh, I don't think he got fired from Voyager, but he was not a. He was a a lower down in the on the rungs back then. Yeah, um, yeah, he definitely got uh, he definitely left Discovery. I don't know if he got fired, but he left. Yeah. And uh, he, he, I think he got fired from American Gods. Oh, I mean, he's not there anymore. Or is he? No, no, after season one, he he and his partner were gone. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought yeah. they were still there for season two. Like Hannibal, didn't he do Hannibal too? Uh, yes, yeah. he did have something to do with Hannibal. Maybe he was showrunner. I don't remember. Yeah, I think he was. I think he was showrunner on Hannibal. I think that he had a very successful run there. What is he doing now? Hannibal was good. I, like I haven't watched it. I keep trying to get us to watch it as the spoiler in time show, and I keep getting a little bit of unstated resistance to it. Mm, I feel like it's um, it's uh it's the kind of show that it would have I would have it would have been more natural on a, on like FX or uh, AMC or something. Weird thing to see on NBC. And yeah, that's probably why it ended early. But it was by wild. the way, hmm. Brian Fuller on IMDb, just a, a little oddity, is Brian Fuller two? Whoa, not the primary Brian Fuller. He's not Brian Brian Fuller Prime. Brian Fuller one is a producer for Sword Art Online. Oh, <laughs> Sword Art Online is a uh, is a is an anime. Okay. Yeah. It's also a couple so Brian of Brian Fuller that we're talking about. He didn't get it on IMDb fast enough. He got beat. Oh, no, I used to be. I used to be the fir- the primary Roger Chang on there until someone discovered more notable. Oh, did you get pushed to two? You got changed. Yeah, I think I'm two or three. I used to be mixed up. They used to amalgamate like three different Roger Changs into one person. It was a very very <laughs> fascinating work history. Yeah, I always get I get confused with it. I don't know really what's going on. Brian yeah. Fuller is no longer on American Gods, although he is still credited as a producer. He's no longer on Star Trek Discovery, although he's still credited as creator. Actually, he's credited as creator on American Gods too. Um, and I don't see any any future projects listed for him. Hmm. So I don't know what he's doing. What happened? Yeah. Also, why can't he's why can't a show just stick with him? Maybe it's a clash of personalities. Well, he worked on Heroes. Pushing yeah. Daisies was a victim of the uh, of the writer strike. He yeah. worked on Dead Like Me and Wonderfalls. Then Pushing Daisies he was his first executive. Pro- well, no, he was executive producer on Wonderfalls too, actually. Uh, but Pushing Daisies was him. Then he was on Heroes as a consulting producer. Oh, yeah. uh, Hannibal was his. Then American God season one, Star Trek Discovery season one. Oh uh, yeah, huh? Hmm. Not doing anything right now. His last Maybe few shows, he's, like, he's like in and out. Like Maybe he's like, I'm just tired of getting fired. I don't want to do anything anymore. Yeah, getting all these these checks as as because of my creator credit. Yeah, I'll just chill out. Maybe I would. Chillaba. Think Give me it. my residuals. Residuals, you can live on residuals forever, man. Like, you know, you say that most people can't, though. Most people you, get residuals. They're like, yeah, my residuals are like five dollars a year. Like, well, it depends on where you're, what it is. Like, if you're, you are, the, yeah, yeah, if you're one of the friends from if Friends, you're Spielberg, you can live on your residuals for sure. I'm pretty sure everybody from Friends could live off Friends money for the rest of their oh, life. Because he has an addiction. Yeah, yeah. I was a friend. I'd quit trying to get roles. I would just be like, all right, now now's the time for me to now's the time for me to bust out my cooking show. <laughs> Can I take a moment to uh to say that I saw the movie Us yesterday? Uh, yes. Jordan Peele written, produced, and directed. Did you like or, it? Would you did you like it? I loved it. It was amazing. Were you were you freaked out, creeped out, or scared, or all three? I was creeped out and then kind of scared. Not so much freaked out. Um, it's got surprises. It's got twists. It plays with the horror tropes in ways that that fool and delight you. Uh, it's not if you're like, is this Get Out? No, this is not an allegory. This is a straight up horror movie. Yeah, uh, and it's not a slasher, although it is bloody. Um, it, it's it's more of a creep you out 
situation and it's got twists and turns, you is know, it, all but is, is any of it like tongue in cheek and like the way cabin in the woods was like, you know how it's not tongue in cheek, the way cabin in the woods was no, but I think Roger, you might like the fact that there's some really good family dynamic comedy uh, because the, the main character is played by Lupita Nyong'o and she is the mother of two kids and it starts with, well, it starts with a flashback, but the, the main story is that her family is at a, uh, at a, a beach cottage near Santa Cruz uh, and they're on a family vacation. So there's all, all through the thing, there's the, those like family dynamics of, you know, the, the, the tween girl who thinks her younger brother's dumb and the younger brother's kind of awkward and you know the dad telling the dad jokes at the very beginning and all that and then that pl- when the horror stuff starts to happen that plays into it really well it's really funny yeah i want to see it so i'm excited too uh yeah, yeah i don't know if it's the greatest horror movie of all time as faux pas said some critic was saying but uh I do know that the editor in chief of Rotten Tomatoes has seen it twice now and loved it every time and plans to see it again. So uh, he's a he's a harder man to to please. Uh, you know, it's weird because for me, a horror film, a good horror film, is the one where you're still like freaked out, like thinking about it, like yes. long, like after you've even after you've seen it. Yeah, I said not freaked out because it didn't like scare me. It's not like I couldn't go to sleep, but I was definitely still thinking about it. Like. Uh, um, I just want to give our listeners an example. So if anyone who's a paranormal, um, paranormal, Mm -hmm. uh, what's it? Paranormal activity. Activity. For like a couple of nights afterwards, I was hypersensitive to any noise I heard Mm -hmm. after watching that. You know what I mean? Like something like that. Uh, there, there is an element to that. I don't know if it's spoilery to say. Uh, Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. All right. All right. Play it safe. There is a thing that Eileen plans to plan to do at work today based on the movie to try to creep out her coworkers who had seen it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. I mean, scissors are a big part of it. Uh, I definitely don't look at scissors the same way. Uh, (laughs) I'm dying to know what that's about. That's all in the advertising. It's probably not as big of a deal as, as you might think, but it's the, it's the less spoilery thing. Cause you can already imagine like, Oh, I, you know, people are trying to stab people with scissors, but it's pretty creepy the way it, it's used scissors have the have their own i mean are there going to be memes about scissors the theater that where we showed up had uh it was an arc light and um they have a clock and the clock had been wrapped in a huge pair of golden scissors oh my <laughs> gosh all right <laughs> wow uh i happened to be wearing the color red and so when we came out of the movie people were pointing out like oh my god you're wearing red oh stuff another. like that all right there's actually there's a great scene uh, in in one part while the, while the, when the horror stuff is happening where they make fun of uh, smart speakers. Oh, good. Yeah, uh, that's pretty funny. Wow, that's uh, specific. Yeah, it's uh, Ophelia is the voice assistant. It's not any of the actual voice assistants. Ophelia. It's like, hey, Ophelia, play me some beach songs. You know, I feel you. I feel you, Ophelia. <laughs> I don't like the name. The name's hard to, I wouldn't want to say that to a box. Have you seen those ads for, there's like an ad where they kind of do the whole take on the uh, voice assistant, but it's like a German like voice assistant. And it just gives you really just bizarre uh, results or answers to your queries. She's super ticked and sounds really judgmental and all that. Cause that's what I expect from my yeah. German. Uh, this one is like, they, they ask about like, tell us about the mood and this voice assistant says, well, the, there's, you know, there's only two moons after the third one got destroyed in a cataclysmic event. Oh, man. You know, like it's, it's, but it's part of a commercial. And I'm trying to remember what it's for. It's a take on those. It's kind of like a, a, um, a take on those uh, Geico ads mm. where they mm-hmm. do like the faux thing. Sure. That's a oh, check. I'm sure I can look to see on YouTube. Well, uh, while you're looking to see on YouTube, we are going to end our video, which is available on YouTube. But thanks, everybody, for watching. Audio folks, stick around. There's more to come. I love you.